Narendra Modi has talked about it for years. Today, India started work on a bullet train, fast-forwarding its colonial-era railway system with a $17 billion scheme. It's mostly funded by Japan, and Shinzo Abe helped lay the foundation stone. But will it be able to address India's growing infrastructure needs? And what does it actually mean for Japan? Well, Davina Gupta has been finding out. In a major revamp for a century-old railway network, India is set to be the first South Asian country to import Japan's iconic Shinkansen or the bullet train. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, during his two-day visit, laid the foundation stone for the 750-seater bullet train. It will connect India's financial hub Mumbai to Ahmedabad, which is in the Prime Minister's home state, and will reduce the travel time from eight hours to just three hours. It's a major upgradation in infrastructure in the Prime Minister's home state where elections are due later this year. India has fallen way behind in developing its rail networks. This year alone, there have been multiple derailments costing lives. Indian government has promised to pump in $59 billion to meet the infrastructure needs. So this project means not only faster and safer travel for Indians, but also creation of at least 40,000 jobs. For Japan too, it's a win-win situation because Japan has found it difficult to compete against China's less expensive railway projects. And India's project is a golden ticket for Japan to showcase its technology and eye other projects in the region. Well, Davina Gupta reporting there. Well, that's the dream anyway. A couple of years ago, I was in India with Global reporting on the state of India's railways. And I thought it was worth playing a little bit to understand the gulf between the bullet train idea of today and most people's daily experience. When you travel on India's trains, the challenges are right there in front of you. The system is creaking. It's carrying 23 million passengers a day. And the trains are slow. An average speed of 31 miles per hour. And if you point the camera outside, I'll show you more of the problems. The track, the whole of the infrastructure needs developing. In this vast country, there's only about 40,000 miles of track. They've only built 7,500 miles since the British left here in 1947. That is staggering, isn't it? Let's return to that story about India's bullet train, uh, the foundation stone laid today. Let's return to Marwan uh, Narayan, who's waiting to speak to us there in Delhi. And apologies that uh, we lost the sound to you a no short problem. while ago. I was asking you, how significant is this moment uh, with this bullet train foundation stone, do you think? Well, it's in Gujarat, and I was joking that uh, it's not the bullet train, but the ballot train, because it's the prime minister's uh, home state that goes to polls next year, uh, the state assembly. But jokes apart, it's a sweet deal for India, because Japan is really looking to boost its presence in India, which is uh, still uh, likely to be the fastest growing major economy in the world. And it's connecting two very rich cities, Ahmedabad and Mumbai, and therefore, uh, and the money is coming very cheap to, for India, you know, something like $20 billion, 80% of it at uh, close to 0% interest rate, you could say almost. So that's cheap, but that doesn't take away the fact that there are 92,000 kilometers of routes that need attention, and uh, there's fear of derailment or safety threats that's sure. still going on. Maybe Japan could teach a lesson or two to India on how to be safe, because apparently the bullet train has had a, a zero fault track uh, safety record. I'll come record. back to, to, to some of those wider issues in a moment, but uh, I mean, why is it taking foreign money to do this? Well, because India doesn't have enough of its own money to maintain its own, uh, you know, huge uh, railway network, which is the first, fourth largest in the world. There's a huge dilemma of whether to expand it, to take it to new regions, or to maintain it and uh, maintain it in a better way. And that costs a lot of money. And if we were to charge the passengers more, that dramatically affects the movement of millions of laborers across the country and poor people across the country. So in economics, we call it externalities. There are lots of good spin-offs from having a cheap railway network, but the flip side is that you don't have enough cash to expand it or maintain it easily. So yes, it's a bit of a... Th that's absolutely right, it, it, because in recent times, they've tried to hike the prices, and there's been an absolute outcry, and they've had to, to backtrack, haven't they? 
Yes, in fact, if you look at it, India has had a uh, coalition politics and coalition governments for about two decades now. And you always have allies threatening the main ruling party over uh, hiking passenger fares. And the railway ministry has been a plumb uh, sort of a post for coalition allies or uh, ministers from smaller parties who have been literally partying with the railway money, uh, taking, uh, you know, launching new trains to their own constituencies and stuff like that. And that kind of has created a culture of prof profligacy that yep. doesn't go with a systematic scientific management of the railways. Just so uh, there is a tough choice there. Just a final, final overall thought because, I mean, talk of bullet trains gets glitzy headlines. How much does it mask other problems? You touched on safety. Uh, we were showing uh, viewers a, a short while ago when we were last there, just the speed of the trains for ordinary people. The amount of track that's been laid is only 7,000 miles since the British left India, and you have a freight system which is so bad that most freight is moved on the roads. I mean, there are so many fundamental problems. How, how far away are we to fixing those? Yeah, well, the Modi government seems to be very uh, bent on privatizing a huge amount of the business. And uh, to that extent, it can make it more economically viable. And this is a very stable government compared to the previous coalitions. And to that extent, they have a political will to ram it through. But there is still a fiscal problem of how do you raise money for all this without, uh, let's say, fanning inflation on the passenger fare front. So there is a long way to go, and there is a juggling act to be done. But uh, there are uh, there is money available in the international market today because India is a more bankable proposition than it was before. So hopefully they will use that to uh, sweeten the deals in such a way that uh, you know there could be a soft landing for some of the hard choices that the government faces. Well, Madhavan so, Narayan, uh, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Now let me just show you live pictures from Lang.